Gary is a member of this institute for longer than any of us can remember. Um, and has been involved in Andean studies as one of its primary players um, for a very long time. Got his degree at the University of Illinois, taught for many years at Colgate, and of course now is at Harvard and is currently the chair of anthropology there. And um, with some help from my friends, we've tried to reduce Gary down to one sentence. And we'll see if I can get this right. And the idea is that Gary has made some of the greatest contributions to understanding how the Andean mind sees the universe. Something we could all use a really big dose of, and especially <laughs> from the brilliant mind of Gary. So, Gary, can you take us to keep moving? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John. Goodness, I have no idea what to say now. <laughs> nothing to say, really. Uh, except to say, in the first place, thank you so much to John and to all of the officers of the Institute of Andean Studies. I am aware that this pushes the bounds of propriety to be able to, to uh, uh, speak before the audience in the keynote lecture twice in three or four years or something on that order, so I am deeply grateful. Uh, to you for this privilege and honor. I'm also uh, painfully aware that I'm the only thing that stands between you and the good beer and wine and uh, food <laughs> of the president's reception, so I'll do this with as much alacrity and good humor as possible. Uh, so again, thank you so much uh, uh, to all of you for coming out this evening. For those who are coming in sort of from the outside uh, and, and are not intimately familiar with the subject matter we've been dealing with in this um, meeting over the past two days, we're talking about the continent of South America and more specifically we're talking about that portion of the Central Andes on the west uh, central part of the continent of South America. So this includes the Pacific Coastal Desert, uh, the Andes Mountains, the central portion of the mountains that uh, run, of course, from Colombia uh, and the Gulf of Mexico down to Tierra del Fuego, and then in the north, the headwaters of the Amazon, and in the southeast, the headwaters of the Paraná River uh, that flow down through Argentina. So this is the region that we're interested in. Uh, and uh, we, uh, in, in this talk, I'm interested specifically in uh, that area uh, insofar as it was the uh, territory of the Inca Empire, Tawantinsuyu, the four parts intimately bound together, uh, that uh, had their northern boundary more or less on the present day boundary between Ecuador and Colombia, running down through uh, Peru, through uh, Bolivia, northwestern Argentina, and Chile down to a couple of hundred kilometers or so south of Santiago de Chile. Uh, so this is the area that we're concerned about. This was the great empire, the uh, most extensive empire of the pre-Columbian New World. Uh, the Inca Empire existed only for a very short period of time. It was the end product of a long sequence of cultural evolution in the Central Andes. It existed only from around 1450 or so, maybe slightly earlier than you see here. Uh, until its conquest by Francisco Pizarro and his troops in 1532. Uh, and uh, so that's the period that we'll be interested in. And so this was the time of the Inca Empire in the Central Andes. And since we have to talk about something, the thing about that we're going to talk about is about uh, record keeping and accounting. So we could talk about uh, ceramics or we could talk about textiles or yama herding, but it happens that this evening we're going to be talking about <coughs> record keeping and accounting in the Inca Empire. Uh, so you see here a drawing on the bottom left from, uh, a, um, uh, from the work of an indigenous chronicler, Wamampoma de Ayala. He uh, wrote a thousand page letter to the King of Spain near the end of the 16th century in which he protested the conquest of the of the Andes. Uh, in that work, in that letter of protest, he included drawings of life in Peru before, during, and after the time of the Spanish conquest. And this is one of our uh, best sources for visual representations of the world of the Inca 
again, his idealization before, uh, during, and after the time of the Spanish conquest. So you'll see many images from the work of Juan Poma de Ayala. Uh, as, I'm, as I'm talking to you about the quipus, or record keeping in the Inca Empire today, uh, I will have in the back of my mind a comparison between what was going on in the Andes in terms of record keeping and accounting and what was going on at the same time in Europe. And it so happens that this was just the time, 1494, so just before the, the uh, conquest of the Inca Empire in 1532, of the production of what was the first book of double entry bookkeeping. Uh, this was a mathematical text by Luca Pacioli, uh, which was written and published in 1494, uh, and it contained the first description of double entry bookkeeping, which uh, for any accountants in the audience, in the first place, why are you here? But thank you for coming. <laughs> but uh, but uh, this, of course, you will know is the crown jewel of uh, accounting in, in uh, Western Europe and uh, uh, still is the principal method used in accounting practice. And I want to have this development in global accounting history uh, conscious in the back of our minds as we go about looking at what was going on in, in terms of Inca accounting at this time. And the principal device for accounting was the quipu, this knotted string, generally colorful device uh, that was used for recording various kinds of information. On the right, we see another drawing from Juan Poma de Ayala. On the left, a drawing from the Chronicle of Martin de Morua. Uh, a uh, priest who wrote a chronicle in the 1590s, and we think that uh, the drawings that are included in his work, in fact, were, were produced by, uh, by the indigenous chronicler, Juan Poma de Ayala. So we'll see some images from uh, Martin de Morua's chronicle as well. But uh, so we uh, see images of the holding and the manipulation uh, of quipus in uh, these two uh, colonial visual source works. Uh, and then we also have uh, now a, a almost 900 quipus that exist in museum collections around the world. Uh, and I'll be talking to you about a set of those uh, today. So basically when we're talking about quipus, they were essentially two different types of quipus. Uh, so there was one type of quipu for administrative work, and that's what I'm going to be talking to you about uh, tonight. Uh, there was another type, though, that, uh, as we're told by the Spanish chroniclers, recorded uh, historical narratives, recorded poems, recorded songs, all sorts of narratives telling the life history of the Incas, etc. Uh, these were a very complex uh, form of quipu that uh, I, uh, in truth, haven't the foggiest idea how to interpret now. They're very complex. They have. Uh, they are uh, knotted string devices and the knots are spread all over the, the uh, 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 surface of the quipu, uh, quite unlike the quipus that I'll be talking to you about this evening. Uh, so here are two examples of what I think are probably narrative quipus, ones that uh, uh, were we to understand how to interpret them, uh, we could uh, read, we could take information from them and we could tell the life history of perhaps this or that Inca. Uh, the kinds of uh, quipus that I'm going to be talking to you about this evening were ones that had to do with the administration of the uh, Inca Empire. So the, uh, for administrative purposes, the Incas used a decimal system of administration. Uh, here it's important to point out that the main form of tribute in the Inca Empire took the form of a demand for labor tribute. So the Incas did not take anything from the larder or from the storehouse of any individual, but rather they required that every subject of the empire work a certain number of days each month for the empire. And uh, these work groups were formed in groups of 10, uh, uh, and uh, five groups of 10 could form a larger work group of 50, two groups of 50 could form a group of 100, and you see how these groups could incrementally buy fives and twos uh, 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 ultimately formed very large work groups up to the largest named group, the, the Hunu, which was a group of 10,000 workers. Uh, information about the requirement for labor time was kept by the quipus. So here they were recording time, time owed, time paid, uh, and we think that was an important part of the recording of information in the quipus. 
Uh, each, uh, each one of the 80 provinces of the Inca Empire had a, what was called a toprico, uh, the one who oversaw, the one who oversaw the business of the Inca in the province. And the toprico was, uh, was attended uh, in the business of state administration by a group of quipu keepers. So we see one of them here, an administrador de provincias, an administrator of the provinces who uh, has a, a, a couple of quipus here he's holding in his hand, which he presumably then has information that pertains to this uh, business of keeping track of tribute. <coughs> the, uh, there were other uses of the quipus, so they recorded information on the periodicities and the cycles of celestial phenomena of the uh, sun and the moon and the planets and the stars. And uh, so the calendar specialists were specialists in kipu keeping, and then also uh, kipu's uh, uh, information about the business of state moved around the empire on the Inca road system uh, carried by chasquis, an example of which we see here in one of the drawings of Wamapoma, in which he just emphasizes what this is. He has a little cartoon sign here that says carta or, or letter. Uh, that's, that's attached to the, the uh, kipu that he's carrying. Uh, and another function of the kipu keepers was to keep track of the uh, goods that were in the Inca storehouses. Uh, and here it'll be useful to, to just say right now that all uh, uh, territory in Tawantinsuyu in the Inca state belonged to the Inca. Everything, in fact, belonged to the Inca. And in terms of land, land was divided into three parts. One third was the land of the state, one third was the land of the gods, and one third belonged to uh, the commoners. So those were the lands that were, that were for, the, for the sustenance of the, of the tributaries of the Inca. Uh, on the lands of the state, uh, these were the lands that were, that were planted and harvested by work groups and the harvest then went into the state storehouses. And what we're going to be talking about then today, uh, this evening, is uh, storehouse accounting. So the, the goods that we're talking about insofar as they involve uh, 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 food products, plants, uh, were products of the, of the fields of the Inca that had been tended by the by the state workers. Uh, so just a short introduction here to the quipus uh, for those who don't really know anything about them. So the quipus built on the uh, framework of uh, one uh, a fairly thick cord that's called the, the primary cord or the, or the main cord. Uh, often these cords are quite colorful, so they're wrapped cords. Uh, these are, I should just say here, the quipus are uh, spun and plied either cotton uh, fibers or camelid, uh, that is yama or alpaca. Uh, the majority of kipus that we have that survive are of cotton. Uh, they come from the coast and uh, uh, we think that the tradition of making camelid or yama and alpaca uh, kipus uh, was the primary form of kipu making in the highlands and uh, conditions for preservation there are very poor so we have very few uh, uh, camelid fiber kipus that exist from the highlands. Most come from the coast. Uh, so you have the main cord or the primary cord uh, from which, uh, uh, to which are attached a variety of what we call pendant strings. So these are tied or these are knotted onto the primary cord and in many cases we have subsidiary cords, second level cords that are tied onto the pendant strings and you have hierarchical arrangements of uh, subsidiary cords attached to subsidiary cords attached to subsidiary cords which are attached then to the pendant string. We have kipus with up to six levels uh, uh, deep of uh, 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 hierarchies of information recorded on the kipus. Uh, we also uh, have some uh, uh, kipu cords that come off from the top uh, whose attachments bind together groups of these pendant strings. These are particularly important in terms of mathematics. Turns out the kipus we're talking about tonight don't have top cords, so we're not going to talk about that structural feature. Uh, we can talk about it more if you have any questions. And then uh, some kipus have what I call uh, loop pendants, and these are pendant strings that are attached to 
uh, chords that are tied onto the main string and that loop down uh, below the main chord. Uh, also, the kipus we're talking about don't have those, but I just thought you should have the full sort of run of the structural features of the, of the kipus. Uh, on your sort of ordinary garden variety kipu, so the majority of the kipus, when you look at them, you see uh, the chords are knotted and the knots are not like the ones that I showed you on those earlier kipus that are spread all over the surface of the kipu, uh, but rather that are in uh, ranked files up the, up the length of the kipu chords as you see here. And this relates to the recording of numerical information in the base 10 uh, decimal system of the kipus. So like us, the Incas had a base 10 system of numeration. Uh, you see the names for the numbers here. And uh, uh, the kipu chords were knotted in uh, files or in tiers that were linked to the place value uh, of, 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 of the numerical information that was being recorded on the kipu, so that toward the bottom of the strings you have the ones, then the tens, the hundreds, the thousands, uh, the tens of thousands, and we have some, there are few kipus that record up to hundreds of thousands, but, but theoretically you could record into the millions. I've not encountered a kipu that records the millions, but you could do it quite easily just with a very long string. Uh, so in these uh, different place values, they tied a number of different types of knots. So they had several different types of knots to record the values from one to nine at the ones level. Uh, they used the uh, simple overhand or what I call granny knot at the tens, hundreds, thousands level. Uh, and uh, then they, um, uh, yeah, so those are the principal knot types. You have. Uh, uh, what we call a figure eight knot that was tied for the value one, and then eight different varieties of what we call long knots to record the values two to nine. On these knots, you can run your fingernail over the knot and you can count the number of turns between two to nine. So there you can actually read the numbers. So that we can read the numbers uh, on, these, on these kipus. The numerical kipus make up about two thirds of the uh, almost 900 kipus that I've inventoried now. So it's only about a third of them that are those narrative kipus. Two thirds of them or the uh, great majority are uh, kipus that record numerical values. Uh, uh, so they're quantitative. So that on these kipus, the quantitative ones, you can read down, you can look at the placement of knots. And uh, here we see one knot in the hundreds level, one in the tens level, and a knot of th uh, three in the ones level. So that's 100 plus 10 plus three or 113. It's important to point out here, uh, since at this time in Western Europe, um, basically the Hindu Arabic uh, uh, numerals were being introduced, were being used for the first time. They'd been introduced by about 1000 AD or so, but it took four or 500 years to actually be incorporated into the mathematical system and the accounting system. But there they had uh, a, a symbol for zero, for the absence of value. And in the Inca Kipu, they had a way of, of signifying the absence of value, which was not by a sign, like the zero, but rather by the absence of a knot in the place of value. So if you want to record the number 102, you just leave the tens place empty, and then you read 100 plus 2 is 102, yeah? So the numbers were quite good, and I would, uh, should just point out here that uh, they, they, they didn't do calculations with the kipus. The, uh, the, the kipus were knotted with numerical values that were calculated elsewhere. We think they used these devices called upanas that are counting boards. I'll talk about this a little bit later. So they did all the calculations over there with kernels of corn or with pebbles in these counting devices. And then when they had the values, they recorded them on the kipu. So what we're looking at with the kipu is the results of calculations. Uh, so uh, when we have a string with a certain value, so you know we can be pleased with ourselves, we know this string says 102, what we don't know is 102 what? And that's actually sort of a fundamental problem and that's the fundamental problem of kipu studies is we still don't know how to, to uh, consistently interpret what kinds of information has been recorded. We think that partially it was done using color, 
So many of the quipus are quite colorful from the dyeing of cords or from the natural colors of camelid fibers. Uh, they come in all shades of browns and blacks and grays, etc. And so we think that color coding was an important part of it. I've been recording uh, the colors in quipus. We've, we've recorded about 650 of the 900 quipus now in a database that I started working on uh, some uh, 14 years ago or so. Uh, so we think color was important. Color was used not only probably to signify certain identities, uh, certain colors had certain associations with uh, objects or products or statuses, and also color was used to organize information on a kipu, that you would have uh, cords of one color followed by cords of another color followed by cords of another color and those color differences we think were the ways they organized different categories of information on the kipus. Uh, so that's all uh, 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 important to know but just in the background for us now we're not going to be worrying about that too much but uh, just so you have some sense of the way these things operate. Uh, they, were, they were actually operated by a cadre of uh, kipu keepers called kipu komayaks, uh, those, who, those who make or organize or animate the knots. Uh, so the term kipu itself means knot. And uh, so we have various representations here from the Chronicles of Marua and Wamampoma de Ayala showing uh, kipu keepers holding and manipulating and presenting uh, kipus in various ways. So there was, a there was a hierarchy of kipu keepers with the principal ones being in the capital Cusco and uh, mid-level kipu keepers being out in the provincial centers and then local kipu keepers uh, who were keeping their local records and passing the information on up the, that uh, uh, chain of hierarchy. We can talk about this, but keep that in the back of your mind because that's important. There were also archives of these things, we're told by the chroniclers. For instance, here Martin de Morua says that the accountants had great heaps of these cords in the manner of registries like our scribes have their written documents and they kept their archives in such a manner that if they needed to know something, they had only to go to one of these kipu kamayaks. Uh, from our studies of, its, uh, of, of the kipus that are extant in museum collections, so this is in Europe, North America, and South America, so I say here they're 875, but they're close to 900 now um, uh, uh, that I've inventoried, and about 250 of them or so have reasonably good proveniences. A lot of these came from graves and were plundered by grave robbers, and so we don't have good, uh, good provenience data but uh, we have reasonably good provenience data on about 250 of them, and these form what I call archives uh, that uh, were found in certain places, uh, certain named, uh, named places or, or, or regions in a river valley, so we have some general confidence that they sort of pertain to each other. And uh, what you see over here is a general representation, a sort of summary icon of the uh, characteristics of kipus from that archive. So we find, for instance, a lot of these uh, loop pendants in this collection in the far north. We have six chord groups here in the Santa Valley, four chord groups in uh, one part of the Rimac Valley, three chord groups here, etc. A lot of subsidiaries in uh, the group of kipus down in Arica. So there are these differences in and I think that they represent something like species of a genre, like they're all of the genus Kipu, but there are these various differences, and I don't frankly know now how to account for why there are those differences. Uh, you know a Kipu when you see it, but one may be a little bit different from the other. There may be regional differences, ethnic differences, something on that order. So, uh, but, uh, so those are the uh, kipus that were known up until uh, 2013. And then in 2013, there was a, a, there was a fairly large archive of 34 kipus. It was added uh, from the discovery, from the, uh, from the excavation of an archaeological site on the south coast of Peru, the site of Inca Huasi, which we'll uh, talk about today. This was the work of Dr. Alejandro Chu, uh, a, a, uh, an uh, archaeologist trained at San Marcos, who's now teaching at uh, uh, Catolica University in Lima. Uh, so this is the Kipu archive that I'll talk to you about this evening. Uh, so the site of Inca Huasi then is located in the Cañete Valley. It's one of these uh, rich river valleys 
bordered on either side by the very dry coastal desert. The river here is running from our left to our right, uh, water coming down out of the Andes and running to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, the site of Inca Wasi is located down from uh, where uh, 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 that last photo, which was the town of Luna Wana, which is the nearest town to Inca Wasi. Here, uh, now we're looking to the north and the river's running from the right uh, down to the left. Uh, and this is the edge of the river valley here and Inca Wasi sits above the river valley stretches a little less than a kilometer along the valley. There are various parts of it. Um, uh, of, I'm sorry, a residential area down here, the palace, uh, the storehouses we're going to talk about here, and administrative buildings there. The site of Incahuasi, we have some information on it from the Spanish Chronicles, and we're told that it was built as a staging area for the Inca conquest of the south coast and especially when the Incas went down to conquer these very bellicose warlike people, the Warco people, they were the sort of bad guys on the, on the south coast. And uh, so the Incas came down, built Inca Wasi and that was their uh, site for, for provisioning the troops in the conquest of the south coast. One of our chroniclers, uh, uh, Ciesa de Leon, uh, writing in 1553, tells us that the Incas built a new city to which he gave the name New Cusco, the same as his main seat or the Inca capital. They also tell that he ordered that the districts of the city and the hills should have the same names as those of Cusco. So they built this city and they named everything the same apparently as in Cusco. One of the students of Inca Wasi, John Hislop, uh, the uh, anthropologist who did the great study of the Inca road system work from 1980 to 1984 uh, at Inca Wasi, mapped the site, did, did a fantastic job there, and he felt that Inca Wasi could be divided into four quadrants just as the Inca empire itself was divided into four quadrants that you have the big division of the upper part or Hanan on one half of the site and the lower part or Hurin on the other side and the two parts uh, were then subdivided making uh, the four quarters of, uh, of the site of Inkawasi. I don't know whether to, what to think about that but there you have his, uh, his particular interpretation of it. Uh, Ciesa tells us that uh, after they defeated the Warco and other uh, uh, tribes on the south coast and peace having been restored to the valley, uh, the Incas ordered, uh, the Inca ordered the new Cusco he had built raised and with all the army he returned to the city of Cusco. So supposedly the site was completely wiped off the face of the earth, burned, destroyed completely, uh, but that's not the case. So the site still exists today in uh, a, a fairly reasonable condition. At the core of the site are these two uh, 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 facilities. So uh, the one on the left uh, includes a palace and an ushnu. Uh, or a ceremonial uh, uh, center, and to the right is a temple of the sun uh, that borders uh, 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 against the northern edge of the storage facility that we'll be uh, talking about here. Uh, so here's a balloon photograph of the storage facility, an oblique angle view that John Hislop made uh, showing us the Temple of the Sun over here, a narrow little corridor that divides the Temple of the Sun from this great complex of the uh, storage facility here. Uh, you see that structure here, here this is overhead as a balloon uh, photograph that John made in the 80s, uh, showing uh, then the core of the um, the storage complex, these rectangular structures, in the center of which there's a platform that probably was an administrative place uh, or, or a, a, a facility ov overseeing the movement of goods into and out of the storage complex. Small square uh, storage uh, uh, deposits that surround the, the facility on three sides. And then up here, uh, here's the corridor dividing this from the Palace of the, the Sun and four kayankas, these rectangular buildings, enclosed buildings, and two open uh, storage spaces here. I call these uh, sorting spaces or drying spaces. We'll get to those in a moment. But uh, uh, so uh, uh, the kipu finds were from this upper part of the storage facility here. So as Alejandro began excavating it, he uh, began excavating first in this corridor and he found that the walls of the corridor had been pulled down 
so as though perhaps from the purposeful destruction of the, of the, of the walls of the storage facility and uh, there then uh, beneath the stones and the mortar uh, you, uh, he could see like strings coming out so he, he started excavating uh, that part of the site. Uh, and then he subsequently began excavating in the Kalyankas and found various kipus just a few centimeters below the surface of the, of the Kalyanka floors and of those floors of the open sorting spaces. And in all then, in 2013 and 14, he excavated 34 kipus from that part of the storage facility. Uh, so, uh, so here's Alejandro work with his wife, Rocio. And um, uh, so uh, here, this was in 2014, he was excavating uh, uh, some of the kipus. At the time, uh, we had present here on the site the um, uh, uh, Vice Minister of uh, Culture of Peru, who uh, blessed the kipus as they were found. Now, actually, <laughs> actually, this is Luis Jaime Castillo Butters, so many of you know him. And Luis Jaime was demonstrating how high off the kipu you should hold your camera to make a 3D uh, uh, photographic model of it, right? So, um, uh, so they, were, they were photographed, of course, after they were excavated, and then they were collected, and then uh, 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 after being stored in the storehouse at Inkawasi, they were moved to a conservatory uh, in Lima. So this is the house of Patricia Landa. And uh, so there she received the kipus, she worked on them, she uh, would slightly, uh, uh, lightly mist them and straighten the strings out and pin them down and let them sit for a day or two. And then after she had uh, finished that, then I was able to study them. So um, uh, she did great work of uh, storing out all these great masses, great tangled uh, of, uh, mass of, of, of the kipus. So uh, when we start looking at the kipus, where they came from, uh, so just to be reminded, there are four of these kayankas, uh, the enclosed rectangular buildings. There are two of these uh, uh, sorting spaces or drying spaces. Uh, and then there are uh, actually 36 of these big rectangular storage spaces and 209 of those uh, small square uh, storage deposits around the three sides of the building. And he actually then, in terms of where kipus came from, they all came from this upper portion of the storage facility from the corridor here and from the four kayankas and the two uh, 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 storage spaces. So from the corridor here, where the walls had been pulled down, there's this huge pile about that big around and about that tall of just a great uh, tangle of kipus, uh, some uh, uh, about a dozen, 11 to 12 kipus that were all in a big pile uh, buried under the walls that had been uh, 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 tumbled down. Uh, then from this sorting space, this open sorting space, there was a low depression and a basket had been placed there. And two kipus were tied together and were uh, enrolled, they were, they were put in spiral form, placed in the basket and covered with chili peppers. So this is a cool thing about these kipus is that a lot of them are covered with plant products. So these two are covered with chili peppers. Then in the corner here, this kayanka, 14 kipus were placed in the corner and they were covered with peanuts. <laughs> so they were just like peanuts were dumped over the top of them. And uh, then from the center of this kayanka, there was one kipu, this one, placed in a depression and uh, covered with a couple of hands, handfuls of uh, black beans. So, I mean, I think that these things are found with the products that they were accounting. I mean, that's my hypothesis, could be wrong, but, and also I'll just say there's nothing about any one of these kipus, like this one, for instance, that screams out beans at you. So, or at least at me, uh, I mean, it may be that there's some features, but I cannot yet identify uh, unambiguously, let's say, a bean kipu and distinguish it from a, from a chili pepper kipu. Uh, but it's, 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 it's extraordinary that we, I mean, we've never had this before, the discovery of kipus with the products that we think they were uh, being used to account for. Uh, now, the, uh, talking about accounting and beans and peanuts and chili peppers, of course, nobody accounts, nobody counts beans and 
uh, uh, chili peppers individually. I mean, we caricature accountants as bean counters, but not even, not even accountants count beans. <laughs> And uh, uh, one by one. So how do you? Uh, uh, so so uh, so. In fact, how do you count uncountable things? And uh, what you probably do is you create standardized units of measure. And we think that there's a way they were doing that at Inkawasi. If you look at the two open spaces, um, uh, as as uh, Alejandro began excavating the floors of those spaces, he found that they had been marked off so that the one that you see here on the left, uh, uh, that uh, as he excavated down on that, he came down on these, um, on these rows of, of panels of squares. So uh, you see here a, a set of them in an overhead photograph. You, you see, sorry, that's what it looks like. It's pretty cool. But there are these panels of squares, like three squares and then 39 squares long, and then a little walkway between this panel and the next panel, and then all the way across so that in reconstruction, uh, this is uh, the way we think it looked. Uh, this uh, sort of central area is not preserved. It was worn down, weathered, and uh, so uh, he has this part of the, of, of the of the layout of the squares and uh, this other side. And so, but uh, this is the reconstruction of how we think this thing looked. And so these are, each of these grid panels, I call these grid panels, was three squares by 39 or 117 squares. Just like the Inca, they never do anything like regular, right? You know, like 120 squares or something like that. Uh, they, we think there were about 30 of them laid out across here, so making about 3,510 total squares. Each one of these is a pretty standard 23 centimeters by 23 centimeters. So we think that what they were doing was that they, were, you, they would bring it pro, uh, produce into the site. They would be maybe offloaded into those callancas, the, the rectangular buildings. The products would be brought out into these uh, 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 drying spaces or accounting spaces and the, the uncountable produce would be uh, spread across the, the panels of squares and then you take up a unit. Here's a unit of beans, two units of beans, three units of beans, right. So, uh, so account for them in that way. So in terms of the accounting of these pro produce, we think that they're accounting for standardized units of measure uh, of these goods and so this accounted uh, this amounted to a system of standardization surveillance and control and the control of accounting uh, at the site in terms of uh, Inkawasi accounting methods so we have uh, 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 found several different methods uh, that are evidenced in the uh, study of the kipu cords themselves so this is like sitting and looking cord by cord and recording uh, the numerical information and all structural information on each one of the chords. So, for instance, we see uh, a kind of summing within chords, so that here's one of the 14 kipus covered with peanuts. Uh, here's uh, chord one, and it has uh, this value 13,328. Then it has a, a, a uh, another value here, yeah, uh, 200, and I'm pretty sure this is 208, you have 208 in that position uh, on the other chords, and then uh, other smaller values totaling uh, 13,328. So it's taking this value and breaking it down into, in, into smaller sub-values, or having a number of values here that add up to uh, that sum. So I, I think that there's a, a, yeah, there's some kind of process going on here of the summing of values or of laying out a single value, maybe a certain quantity of goods that are brought in and then they get redistributed. They get broken down into smaller values. Some get stored here, some get stored there, etc. One thing I want to point out in particular is that you have here a fixed value, a repeating value in each one of these um, these accounting sets. So I'm calling an accounting set a big value plus uh, the, the a smaller sums that total that big value. 
Each one has a 208, 208, 208, 208. So this is a fixed value that's, uh, that's represented here. So keep that in mind. Uh, here's another kipu, one of the ones covered with peanuts. Uh, and uh, this one, uh, in fact, has a fixed value as well, but it's 47. So 3,317, 47, 1, 14, 498, 370, 2287 comes to 3,316. So close. Uh, and you can see here there's some sort of difference between these sums and the large sum uh, that's at the beginning of the series. But they're pretty close in general. So I think this is accounting. It's like, you know, so much of this stuff's coming in. We got a big batch of like peanuts coming in, 18, say 1,876 units. Something happens with 47 regularly, 47, 47, 47, 47. And then uh, the remainder gets broken down into uh, 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 different smaller units. So I think there's something here going on in terms of identifying a certain value, one of these fixed repeating values, and then breaking down the remainder into other values. I suspect it's indicating how many of units of that batch get stored here or there or some other place. But so one question is why, if these are both peanut kipus, you have 208 in one uh, kipu and 47 in the other kipu? Don't everybody answer it once, because <laughs> I don't know either, no. <laughs> but that's, that's one of our problems. Here's a really interesting pair, or two pairs of kipus. So here are those two kipus that were inside the basket, that were tied together. There's the knot that ties the main cords together. Here's a pair of kipus that were found out in the corridor. Yeah, that had the walls pulled down on top of it. They're tied together and there's the knot tying them together. And now the interesting thing about these two pairs is that they're two pairs of matching kipus. So that, in fact, when you read the numerical values on the different kipus, these, uh, uh, these numbers match those numbers and these numbers match those numbers. So it's sort of as though these were inside the storehouse, maybe they're used for active accounting, and maybe this pair was out in the corridor, maybe they're a record to compare with what's being, uh, with what's being accounted for here in this batch. But the, the, the further really interesting thing is that they, they, they record the same numerical values, but not the same way. And I think what they're doing is that they're, so that uh, uh, you can uh, see, for instance, in that uh, chart over on the right, that these are a set of numbers from a group of chords here of that kipu, these are of that kipu. So here's uh, chord 44, 45, 46, et cetera. There's chord 50, 51. I'm having a hard time reading over there, and I have small numbers here. But so in the first chord of those two, it's 141, then it's 15, then over here it's 126, and then over here it's 126, and it's 15. So 141 minus 15 is 126, or 141 minus 126 is 15. So you have the same numbers, but they are organized differently. In one, you're subtracting the 15 to get the remainder, and in the other, you're subtracting what is the remainder of the other calculation and getting the 15. So the 15 is fixed. Again, it's like our 47 and 208. The 15 is fixed. They're interested in the 15. Get the 15, but get it in one case by adding it and in the other case by subtracting it. So if you go down, you see the, that um, uh, uh, the fixed value is 15, but that it gets placed in a different place in the three number calculations there, yeah? So I, I think it's like a check, a check on the math of it, right? Uh, and so here, from this other set, these two kipus, they match, but they, uh, and they, and they have the same difference, but now their fixed value is 10. These guys, their fixed value is 15, this one's 10. So 394, 
minus 10 is 384, 394 minus 384 is 10. So again, you get the same three numbers, but they're placed differently to provide a sort of check on the math of uh, 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 those numbers. Yeah. Um, so what they're doing then is that they're, they're uh, uh, in these two kipus, I think they're employing two what I call arithmetic paradigms or arithmetic formulas. So one is a, is a value and a fixed number and the remainder of that value and the other is a large value and um, a smaller value, what will be the remainder of the subtraction of uh, this number over here from the original uh, larger number. So they're working with two different paradigms that I think essentially what they're doing is they're interested in the problem of how do we ensure good math here. And, and so they're, 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 they're moving those different numbers around, putting them in different places in the arithmetic calculations uh, uh, that, they're, that they're doing. So, I mean, they're checking their numbers. Uh, here we see a pair of kipus. So the one on the right is the one we saw earlier that records the fixed value 47. Turns out the one on the left also has the fixed value 47. And, uh, but now we're going to look at another aspect of the matching between these two and the, the two columns of numbers in the center just record the numbers above 1,000 that are recorded on those two kipus. And if you look at those, you'll see that in fact those, they're matches of those. So I can't really see it from there, but 337 matches three. Uh, uh, 3317. This pair sums that value 2287, 2089, 2089, 1271, 1271, and you go down and you can see that they're very close. There are a few cases where the, 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 the match is not exact, but it's close. So, I mean, I think that they're looking at similar values checking and balancing similar values at these, at these large numbers. So above the level of the 47 uh, that matches in the two. And now what I think is interesting about this is that again, this is at the same time the double entry in Western Europe is being established. And it's a system in which you have uh, values that are recorded in two columns and in one column uh, is the debits entry and the other column is the credits entry and those values are supposed to match between the debits and the credits. So in the two on the left you have the debit cash in Simone's name here and uh, uh, that debit cash in Simone's name you credit to Francesco and the amount is uh, indicated here and the same amount is then indicated as a credit uh, to Francesco and debit uh, cash in Simone's name, the same amount. So debit and credit amounts in two columns and those are supposed to, to match up, those are supposed to balance and that's the sort of core principle of the double entry uh, bookkeeping system. And I just think we're seeing something like at least the structure of it, the, the duality and the matching of pairs of accounts that is, if it's not double entry, which I don't imagine it is, but I imagine it's something that's on its way to a double entry-like accounting, debits and credits uh, of, 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 of pairs of matching kipus uh, that we have here. So uh, just, uh, I'll get toward the end here now. Uh, so one thing that I just want to reflect on is this business of these uh, fixed values or the repeating values. So for chili peppers, we have the fixed values 10 and 15. Uh, for the peanuts, we have fixed values 17, 30, 47, 208. So these are repeated over and over again in those kipus linked to those products. And I, again, I'm assuming, but maybe I'm wrong, that the association of those kipus with those products means that in some way those kipus are recording information about those products. Could be wrong. But in any case, we have this interesting phenomenon of the fixed values that are repeated in those kipus. And my suggestion for this is, I think this is a, for a sort of nascent form of taxation. I think what they were doing is 
a certain amount of goods comes into the facility. The facility has to be maintained, has to be supported. You have a certain number of workers who are there, the kipukamayaks and other people who are moving stuff into and out of the storage facilities. So you, ha you have to support that. So these are the king's crops that are coming in, but I think that the accountants are taking out certain quantities and they're holding it out for the support of the facility. I could be 100% wrong, but I think something like this, I, 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 my suspicion is, is that we see something here like the, the introduction of, of, of the concept of the levy or the tax, which I think if uh, left to play itself out, could have had profound consequences for the financing of the Inca state. Uh, but it's really interesting. So, um, but in terms of the kind of information that we have, we have all of this accounting information, and you know, we, we always bemoan the fact that we don't have history. We, we, we can't read those historical documents, but I think there is history that's embedded in these. There's history about the, the making of those panels of squares. There's history about the tying of two kipus together. There's history then about the recording of matching bits of information. And in fact, there's often, uh, you, you could say, a lot of history in, in, in uh, 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 these recorded administrative forms. And in fact, I just found this as I was putting the talk together that uh, by, the author, by uh, Herman Walk, <laughs> who notes that income tax returns are the most imaginative fiction, fiction being written today, which, uh, which uh, 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 you know, for myself, that's not true, of course. I don't know about you, but, um, <laughs> but, uh, but it is the case that a lot of fidget, uh, 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 fudging of numbers gets done, and there's a story there. And, and, and I think that we can say that there is a real historical writing that can be done from the information that we get in these uh, 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 administrative documents. A couple of other general things I want to say. We've been looking at the numbers. When we look at those complicated numbers of like 394, 10, 384, 384, uh, uh, 394, 384, 10, etc. We're looking at the numbers that we're familiar with so we can follow this. Those did not exist for the Kipu Kamayak. The Kipu Kamayak saw only the knots. And the key, all of that math was being done with the knots, right? So here you have, for instance, seven knots in the tens place, one in the tens here, and five down there. That's uh, 70 minus 15 equals 55. So we can say all that, we can write it down in the number 55, but uh, they never translated this, transferred it into a graphemic form. It was always in these four in, in this three-dimensional uh, knotted form. So I think that there's something going on in the minds of these characters that was just extraordinary that we haven't even begun to approach haven't even begun to think about the complexities of thinking in three-dimensional knot forms of the level of mathematical complexity that we've, that we've seen here. These are very sharp characters. At this same time, in fact, uh, we have this uh, famous engraving of the uh, contest between uh, the, uh, 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 the abbasist and the algorist. So the abbasist, this is a poor character, who like, looks pretty uh, like in a state of consternation here. He's being challenged to uh, do calculations with the abacus uh, and is being opposed to the fellow, the bright fellow who has the Hindu Arabic numerals and he's doing the math with the algebra. Uh, there and so demonstrating uh, here at this moment in Western Europe about the advantages of the adoption of uh, Hindu Arabic numerals and the al and, 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 and algebra that comes in then from uh, 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 from Arabic from from Islamic sciences and here we have then in our case in terms of the recording of values we have the knots a vastly different system very different highly complex, you know, I don't even know how to compare these. This is the true original case of apples and oranges. But in terms of the calculation, again, here, these, the, uh, the calculations that recorded here get done in these constructions called yupanas, and uh, we're told in some of the Spanish chroniclers that they were moving around uh, uh, corn 
uh, kernels or uh, small pebbles, small stones doing their calculations and uh, those then uh, would get uh, recorded on the kipu. And here's a drawing by Wamampoma that uh, uh, shows one of these calculators and uh, the kipu. And no, I don't think, by the way, that's those panels of squares. Uh, if, if, uh, uh, just to say, because I've, uh, it, 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 it looks a lot like those panels of squares, but I think this is truly a calculator and that those panels of squares are something else. So, um, this uh, all, of course, uh, and I'll be through in five minutes or less. But uh, uh, this all comes to a close, of course, with the conquest. So Francisco Pizarro and his 126 troops or so come in to the Andes uh, in uh, September, wasn't it? November of uh, 1532. And then they meet in Cajamarca. And Francisco's troops uh, uh, utterly defeat the, uh, the more than 10,000 troops of the Inca. And, capture Atahualpa, and this uh, brings about then the beginning of the conquest of the Andes and the colonization of the Andes under uh, Spanish colonial rule. And Wamampoma then shows us a number of images of the, of the abuse uh, of, uh, of uh, native people under uh, Spanish colonial rule. Uh, one form of this abuse uh, that was uh, represented not so much by Wamampoma as by other subsequent writers was in fact the mathematics and accounting uh, of the system of administration uh, that comes in at the time of the Spanish conquest. And uh, here in uh, uh, Bishop's book, Western Mathematics, The Secret Weapon of Cultural Imperialism, he talks about the significance of the impact uh, and the domination of non-Western cultures by Western mathematics. So mathematics with its clear rationalism and cold logic, its precision, its so-called objective facts, its lack of human frailty, its power to predict and control, its encouragement to challenge and to question, and its thrust towards yet more secure knowledge was a most powerful weapon indeed. And in fact, this is then in terms of the imposition of administrative forms and administrative procedures that uh, mathematics was central to the administrative and colonial imposition on indigenous peoples so that the document written in alphanumeric form uh, became the standard administrative document. But then it's important to point out that indigenous people, the Andean people did learn uh, to read and write. Blas Valera, who himself was a mestizo, who was the source of a lot of information in Garcilaso de la Vega, says that we are slower in understanding their books, than, that is their quipus, than they in following ours, for we have been dealing with them for more than 70 years without ever learning the theory and rules of their knots and accounts, whereas they have very soon picked up not only our writing, but also our figures, which is proof of their great skill. So you did get a whole class of, and very often, these were the former Kipu Kamayas who learned to read and write and manipulate the numbers and keep records uh, at the local level at uh, uh, least. And in many cases as well, they continued to keep the Kipu uh, uh, records as well. So at this time, at the time of the conquest, just before Francisco Pizarro shows up, you have this accounting tradition in the Andes that's going on. Uh, and in Western Europe, you have a, a highly complex system that is developing. Uh, my notion here is that I think that we have enough. Now we can begin to see something about the real complexity and the contours of Inca accounting from the material from Inca Wasi. By the way, much of what I've shown you this evening, we've never seen before. We've never seen, I've been working on kipus for like 25 years, and I've never seen fixed values repeated across kipus. I've never seen those like formulas of like the 394, 10, 384, 394, 384, 10. That, that's, this is completely new. And uh, most of what we see uh, with the Inca Wasi Kipus is completely new. So we're getting really profound insights into the level of complexity of, uh, of the accounting system of the Inca Empire. And it was quite complex, uh, I think, indeed. I just think this is a wonderful image here, the comparison of the accountants and also the sort of poignancy of the finger pointing 
at the accounting books uh, in those two images, which is, which is, I think, quite interesting. And in terms of the European side of this, this is the moment of the development of what was known as the Venetian method. So first used by Venetian methods in Italy in the 15th century, this gets codified by Luca Pacioli, uh, who is known as the father of double entry uh, uh, bookkeeping. I don't know if we have double entry or not. It's not a big deal to me. It would be pretty darned interesting if it was the case, if, if, if we could establish that. What we do have is highly complex state accounting that involves internal summing, calculation with fixed values that might be some form of, of, of taxation. We have paired accounts, so a duality principle, which is rampant in the Inca empire, of course with matching or closely matching values. It may be something like a nascent double entry-like system, alternate uh, arithmetic formulas for checking sums and methods for producing standardized units of accounting for uncountable products. So I think we have a lot of information to go on to begin to like study seriously uh, Inca mathematics and accounting. Thank you very much. together key foods that might have 
how would that move it faster? Well, if you keep track of it faster, I would think that in the state warehouses, they would have separate key groups for incoming and outgoing. Yeah. Well, presumably there's a relationship between, you know, people coming in with yamas or carrying bultos and coming in and they, they, they bring the stuff in. And, you know, I don't think the accounting gets done before the stuff comes in and I think gets put into account, accountable units. So, I mean, there's a sequence to this thing. It's a linear sequence, isn't it? The stuff comes in and then it gets accounted. It, 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 no, it gets counted, and then it gets accounted. And so, you know, I'm, I'm not sure how you speed that up, especially in the fact, in the circumstance where you're not doing the accounting, it's not an abacus, right? Uh, you're, you're not doing the counting with the accounting device. You're doing the counting with the counting device, and then you're recording the results of the counting on the keyboard. So there's still a linear, you know, time laden like 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 process there that, that, that you have to go through in order to get the information in the key pool. Is the 
the overhead value. Right. I mean, because we saw in those numbers that there's leakage, you know, there's a little, and sometimes, it, like, they're counting more than the big sum, and sometimes less. So, you know, some's getting lost, some's draining out, maybe some, maybe there's a miscalculation here or there, but it's certainly close within the ballpark. But the, the overhead value is fixed. So, I mean, it's like, you know, like our taxes are always, like, uh, fixed, you know, it's like our expenses are not fixed, but our taxes are always fixed in the, in the amount. So, like, the state wants its, 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 its like, slice of the pie. And it wants it to be fixed, and that comes out first. And then, and then you know, you jigger the figures there, and hopefully they're close. If they're not, well, you know, presumably somebody got in trouble. But you know, how much, how much difference was allowable before you had to like stop and really fix things? And you can think about the sort of stress that these keeper guys are under because if they get the numbers wrong. One presumes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So they would want to have a system of, of solving. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You haven't seen any other examples of the cows in the floor. Well, uh, uh, Carol Mackey excavated at uh, Farfan. Manchan. Huh? Manchan. Man I'm sorry. Manchan. Manchan. Excavated a room. Manchan. Excavated a room that had some markings on the floor. And she said that in that, and there were and there were squares, but she saw depressions in the centers of the squares, and she thought there they were actually manipulating it, sort of like a giant calculator. But that's the only other example I know of. There, there is this. There's the side of Quebrada uh, uh, de la Vaca, which is not far from Cañete, of course. And there, there's that rectangular storehouse that has the water polished cobbles embedded in the plaza that make lines that like that, that, that like lay out lines uh, in the in the plaza. That's a little bit like this. But those are the only examples I know of. I would just suggest that if there's another way to replicate the standard unit measure that people actually producing the product, you might be dealing with receiving Yeah, you know, I've thought about this, like, would, a, would, a, would, a, would someone bringing in, uh, like, 10 yama loads of, of, of beans know how many units of standardized units of beans they have? I'm assuming no. They just fill up the pack, and they come in, and they spread it out, and the accountant says, oh, you got 42 units of beans there. And so, you know, I don't know, they get credit for whatever. But then also, after it gets stored, after all those beans get all stored together into one of these deposits, then, they, then the general down on the coast says, we need, you know, 100 units of beans down here. So they come. And, and you know, I mean, we talk like this, and this is the way we would talk, but is this the way the English talk? You're doing business here, right? I mean, I suppose you're doing business here. You're moving beans around. Yeah, something that struck me when he was talking uh, about this issue is that, uh, as far as I understand, the keepers are tied. This isn't the most highly editable medium that they've had. It seems it's like not terribly editable, although it is editable. You can untie knots, but it's more trouble. It's easier just to take the damn string off and tie another string. Right. right. Which also strikes me as something of an investment because you do have to get these strings and dye them, and it seems like there is some level of investment in the creation of this kipu, which makes me wonder: is this? really like something that would be very convenient for the counting of an actual inventory? Or does it seem more like this would be something that would be a ratio, like a fixed ratio? This group down here in this valley brings up 394 coca loads of beans every every year. If we keep 10 and 384 are sent along. Well, it may be, I mean, maybe that these are like paradigmatic. Is it, right. is it, you know, I mean, this is the standard that you're expected to meet. Uh -huh. it, is it, and you know, you meet the standard, or you're expected to meet the standard. And maybe one is the standard, and the other is the, the degree to which you, like, m meet the expectation, right? right? I mean, that, but that would be like a checks and balances sort of thing. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. 
And something has to account for the dates as well. Is that what you were saying? Yes. Yes, absolutely. There must be time here somewhere as well. And the kikus must record the time. And when you figure out how they record the time, <laughs> but they must be recording the time because that's critical because you have income and you have output. Like it, it must be that you can, yeah, must be that you keep track of that. In a relative sense, income, output, if not in an absolute sense, you know, the fourth year of the Inca rule of Pachacuti, Inca Yupanqui, right? Peter, one more question the boss said. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I, I feel sure you must have noticed this, but you didn't mention it. So I want to uh, say about your fixed values, peanuts. Your numbers were 17, 30, 47, 208. Right. Uh, 17 plus 30 is 47. 40, that 47 plus 47 is 108. 108, oh, excuse me, 104. 104 times 2 is 208. So there's a so mathematical progression there. But 47 plus 47. No, I didn't. <laughs>